There we go. Okay, folks, let us go ahead and get started. Welcome to um, the January meeting of the Mountain View Computer Users Club. And today's major topic is going to be computer maintenance. We put this in because the we've been getting a lot of questions this past couple of weeks about the new Macs. And these are the two most often asked questions. First one is, can you use an iMac monitor with a Mac Mini? <clears throat> in other words, if you own an iMac, it's got a beautiful monitor on it. Can you use that monitor and just upgrade and buy a new Mac Mini? The answer to that is no, can't be done. The M1 Mac does not support that type of video interface. It will connect to just about any monitor that supports um, USB-C or USB-4. It's the same thing. So you don't have to buy the expensive Mac monitor. You can buy any good monitor and use it with a Mac Mini. There's also an HDMI port, so you could have an HDMI monitor as well. Um, have you tried that yet, Barry? Yeah, I've got two monitors. I got one in the HDMI port and the other in the Thunderbolt 4, USB 4. What's the comparison? They both work. <laughs> I yeah, don't is know the what you mean. HDMI good enough? Yeah, I've got a I've got a, a high density uh, 27 inch uh, display from Monoprice in the for the HDMI monitor, and it's it's looks just as sharp as the uh, LG ultra fine monitor that Apple worked with uh, them to make for uh, it was several years ago now, but it's also a Retina display, so they, they okay. both look. So you're running a 4K monitor then, right, or a 6K? To, uh, they're both 4K. Okay. So, and the next most asked question, can you run Windows in an M1 Mac? Well, the answer to that is, it's coming soon. Now, there's a bunch of YouTube videos out there that say you can. That's very misleading. One of the big rumors out there is that Windows X is going to be an armed base, which is a new processor type, base operating system, which means you'll be able to run Windows natively on an M1 Mac. I'll believe it when I see it. The fact that you'll be able to run a virtual machine is just around the corner. Now we're going to go into my favorite section of the meeting. It's share a tip or favorite application. And we're going to start off today with Barry, who's got a tip on iOS. And I'll turn it over to Barry. My tip, as you may have seen there on the slide, tongue slightly in cheek is read the manual well uh well we all know that you know apple makes these devices uh and ios is supposedly so easy to use they don't even give you a manual <laughs> they barely give you a quick start guide in the box with an ipad or an iphone um, <clears throat> but a lot of that uh ease of use is due to a <laughs> a lot of hidden complexity <laughs> in the operating system. And there's a lot of stuff that's hard to discover. So what happens uh, when you get confused or trying to figure something out and you think, if only I had some instructions to read, I could probably do this. Because <laughs> all of us are, you know, we're smart adults. We can figure things out if only we had a little, little help. In the good old days, Apple did provide a printed manual with all their hardware, but uh, those days are gone. But not really, because Apple does create user guides for all their hardware still. They just don't print them and give it to you in the box. They're all eBooks. And they are operating system specific for each device. So you can get an iPhone user manual for iOS 12. If you're still running iOS 12 on your older iPhone and can't upgrade to iOS 14, 13 or 14. There's an advantage to an ebook manual in that it can be upgraded. So as the new operating system comes out with a new upgrade like 14.2 came out not too long ago and added some new stuff. 
Apple can upgrade the ebook to cover new features if they need to. So where do you get these ebooks? Well, everybody that has an Apple device has an app called Books. <laughs> Makes sense, right? If you open the Books app, you can go to the Apple Bookstore library and search it for your device. So let's do a little demo. So here's my home screen and my books app is not on my home screen. So I just usually just uh, pull down to get the search, start typing the name of the app I want. There it is, top left, tap on it. Here's the books app. So at the very bottom of the screen, you'll see a bunch of icons. There's reading now, library, the bookstore, audiobooks, which is all part of the Apple Books app now. They're no longer in iTunes. And search, which I happen to be already on. Let me cancel out that last search I had going. And if I type in iPhone, looking, you'll see, well, I have in my, it'll give me something in already like my library and I've already downloaded it. But if I look at the suggestions, if you haven't looked at it, seen this before, you'll see this or haven't used the app before. You'll see iPhone user guide, iOS 14, uh, I, iPhone 12 user guide, iPhone 11 user guide. These are common searches that people have been making. So if I have iOS 14, I want that one, I'll tap on that. And there in the bookstore, the iPhone user guide written by Apple Inc. Now mine says 6%. I've actually downloaded it and referred to it. Um, the books app will keep track of how much of the book you have read. Now, a user guide isn't something you'll probably like start at the beginning and read through the end. <laughs> so that's not going to be very helpful in terms of your reading goals, maybe if you have that kind of thing going on. But if you have never downloaded, there'll be a button there that just says get, G-E-T, because it's free. So you tap on that and it downloads to your device and it goes into your library, which I tapped on at the bottom left. There it is, the iPhone user guide. I'll tap on it and open it. And it just happens to open to where I was the last time I was I was referring to something in the user guide. So if you have a question about your iOS device and you think, well, if I just had some instructions to read, get the user guide for your device, download it, and then you have that as a reference in your Apple Books app. And if you happen to be using more than one Apple device, and you have this set, so it will sync through iCloud. There's a Books app on the iPad and on the iPhone and the iPod Touch, if you have one, and on a Mac. So you can read the book and it'll synchronize your reading uh, state as well across all those devices. So you can read it on another device if you want to on a bigger screen to get directions to use your your iPhone. So how do you get to the search app on your iPhone? You mean the main search app? Yeah, because I can't find the books yeah. on my iPhone and I can't find how to get to the search app. Okay, so if, if you have if you're on the home screen and you just touch in the middle somewhere and pull down gently. No, that makes everything like I want to um, delete them. No, don't touch and hold. You need oh. to touch and move your finger right away. Oh, okay, Oops. I got it. There you go. And it'll bring a search field up at the very top of the screen. Yeah, some of these touch uh, gestures are, are finicky. So if you touch and hold and remain stationary too long, if it interprets it as mm -hmm. a different command than if you're, if you're just pulling it. That's the end of my tip. Any questions? Before he leaves, Barry? Yeah. Yes. Is there a way not to have to put in your Apple uh, password or your iTunes uh, password for every single thing that you download. Yes, 
Uh, there is a setting uh, in your Apple ID settings, I believe, and you can access this on any device, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, for uh, under, under media and purchase. There's a, a toggle for free downloads to require your password. You can turn that off. So anything that's free, you won't get prompted. And then you can always require your password or delay it like 15 minutes. So if you've been browsing and you're looking in the in any of the Apple online stores, this would apply to music, books, podcast. Well, podcasts are usually all free anyway. Um, what are the other things? Oh, Apple TV, uh, TV shows and video and stuff. Um, anything that you purchase, oh, the app and the app store, <laughs> app stores. Uh, anything you purchase, if you purchase something and then you continue browsing. If you've put in your password once when you start and you keep browsing and purchasing, it won't ask you for each purchase as long as you do it within 15 minutes of the previous. Like I said, you can turn off the require password for free downloads and then you never get prompted for your Apple ID password as long as your device is logged into your Apple ID. Okay, any other questions for Barry? Now, do we have anybody that with an Android chip or favorite app? Now we're gonna move on to the Macintosh and I've got one for everybody that I had totally forgotten about. That you can do a split screen mode in the full screen option. Now, I'm hoping this is gonna work through Zoom, but we do know that up in the upper right-hand corner, you see the green little um, button? Normally when you click on that, it enters the full screen mode like that. But you only have one screen. But if you come up here and you click and hold, you have two other options. Oh, actually, because I have my iPad, is that I can enter full screen mode, tile windows to the left, tile windows to the right. So when I do tile to the left, it puts my full screen on the left and I have my regular desktop over here on the right. And I can get to apps. But it's designed to do this. And then I am take my Safari, click on that and I, and I hope you can see, I have my two screens, two apps in either screen, which I think is kind of cool. When I was playing with my Mac, I found that by accident. Wow, you're doing better than I have. I never find that one by accident. Okay, the other one I want to show, or I want to talk about, and this really is not Macintosh. This is for, this is, well, I just recently bought a Wise home vacuum cleaner. They had it on a pre-release special. It was $199. It is not HomeKin compliant, but it is iPhone Android compliant. What it does for $200, it goes and vacuums the floors in my house. Right now, it only does one room. It is going to be updated any day now to do multiple rooms. You set it up, it goes through, you set it up, you tell it to identify the room, it goes out and maps the room for itself. And then unlike other robot vacuum cleaners, I can set up virtual walls in the app of places I don't want it to vacuum. Every day at 7.15 in the morning, it goes, and right now it goes and vacuums our family room and does a beautiful job of it. Completely unattended, we don't do anything. And then it comes back to its charging unit and recharges itself. So it turns itself on, vacuums the floor, comes back to the charging station and recharges itself for the next day. The reason I'm pointing is this is the cheapest automated home vacuum cleaner I've seen yet. The iRobot version of this runs $700. And this does as good. And the company is called Wise, W-Y-Z-E. And they make a whole bunch of home automation 
devices, lights, switches. The home vacuum cleaner is the first one. I'm waiting for a um, tile floor cleaner, tile linoleum cleaner to come out. While it is not home kit compliant, I don't find that to be a big disadvantage because it works like a champ. We've never had our family room floor as clean as it is now. And pretty soon we'll be able to just pick it up and move it to other rooms. It'll have it mapped out. We can vacuum our floors without us doing a thing. Any questions? Yeah, Barry? I'm just looking at their website. It's, uh, if you buy direct, but it's $200 instead of $250. I don't know. Where'd you get it? Amazon? No, I got it from them. $199. Oh, okay. But right now they are sold out. They were hoping to sell 100,000 units by Christmas. They, in fact, sold out of the first year's supply of half a million. So they are desperately trying to get, um, I don't know how much longer the introductory price of $200 is going to be available. It's normal retail price is $250, which is still a bargain. Like I said, the closest thing I found that works, iRobot, which is about $750, or I think the cheapest is $550. Uh, I know my sister has got one that she paid $350 for. She says it does an okay job, but she's constantly having to tell it where she can't set up virtual walls, which is a big thing in this. Virtual walls makes it so much easier because what I do, I just say, you know, I don't want you to go here because I have too much stuff. So I just tell it in the app, create a wall, and then it just doesn't go there. So that's a really cool device. I strongly recommend it when they become available again. Mike, do you have any tips for uh, Windows? Sure. I can come up with something here. Uh, go ahead and let me uh, share the screen here for a there second. All right. I was asking Carolyn uh, what she might suggest. And as it turns out, well, first of all, John, you may have been wondering what happened to me there for a couple of minutes. I just had my very first blue screen of death on Windows 10. Uh, really? Yes. I had never seen it before after all these years. I was amazed. It happened with absolutely no warning. All of a sudden, I just saw a large blue screen. I didn't even recognize it because it's different from any other blue screen of death. And uh, it just said gathering data and then rebooting. I'm going to have to research that and see what that's about. Yeah, we seem to be having a hard time with electronics in our house. We've had half a dozen different things go wrong in the last couple of weeks. And one of the things that happened was uh, we lost our printer. Uh, it came up, we have a Canon printer. It came up with a B200 error. And I looked on the internet and it said, basically, if you get that error, it's toast. We took it down to Toner's West to talk to the guy there. I told him it's a B200 error. He just laughed. Said, yeah, it's toast. So we had to get a new printer. So we were in the process of hooking up the printer to the Mac. Actually, that wasn't the hard part. The hard part was getting rid of the old one. And that led us to understand or to talk about the differences between Windows and Mac for doing things like that. One thing we agreed on is one thing that Windows has gotten pretty good at over the last uh, few years is its search capabilities. So if you look down on my Windows taskbar here, I'm assuming you can all see the big sunflower. Yes. Down below, uh, I have a little magnifying glass. If I click on that, then it brings up my search bar. And I find this really, really handy for things like, I like the old Windows control panel, which has been replaced by settings, but I found that I could still type in control panel here and actually bring it up. And sometimes it's just easier to find things this way instead of going to start settings and having this kind of interface. The other thing I found really uh, handy with this is I don't have to remember where I have any apps on my system. Uh, if I want to bring up something, for example, uh, Acrobat, I just start typing it in and it knows where it's at. It'll, I can automatically launch it from there. The other nice thing about it is that we all know that we should be running user accounts for our main accounts in our systems instead of administrator accounts. Uh, Sometimes we don't do that, but we should. On this system, I do a run as a user account, but the problem I run into that is occasionally it will want administrator access to do something. And I have found that if I do things like 
Yeah, that's not going to do it. Um, yeah, if I could find one that does it. Yeah, I'm not going to find one right at the moment. Uh, a lot of times I'll type in the name of an app here, and I'll give you the option over to the side uh, to run as administrator. Oops. Of course, you have to uh, be able to spell too. Okay, here, here's my Oracle virtual box. I could just run it straight from here, or I could click on run as administrator. And when I do that, then when it starts to run, it'll bring up the dialog box that asks me to enter my administrator password. So uh, that's a very handy way uh, to get to that uh, sometimes. Most of the time when you launch something that requires Cradle, you go ahead and stop and just bring up the dialog box accidentally. Sometimes it won't. Or sometimes it'll just try to run as a normal user and uh, you kind of get stuck that way. So those are the couple things I wanted to mention uh, when you're writing your Windows 10 stuff. And I'm going to have to research on Windows 10, Blue Screens of Death, and get back to you on that. All right, John, that's all I got. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'd be very, very... I want to just add one thing to what Mike just said. Because on my Surface, I don't even have to go to the search little icon. My search bar is is right there all the time. I don't even have to bring up the little magnifying glass. I just click into the search bar and I search. I just thought I'd mention that. Okay. Barry? Yeah, um, just to respond quickly to Carolyn, as, isn't that probably just a uh, some kind of interface setting? You can have it there all the time or not, probably. I think it, I've it seen that. It might be, but it must be default laptop. because I didn't set it up. Yeah, it might be default on the Surface, but I think I've seen that as a setting on this laptop I got from my IT department. But I do have a question from Mike or anybody else that know, maybe knows this in regards to the breadth of those those searches does it does that search just search uh windows and the contents of the hard drive or will or will it actually search beyond like if you're trying to find that something on the web or does yes. it give other kinds of search results yes it starts with uh, searching locally on windows and then it'll also actually do the web automatically if it can't find anything uh, on your system, it'll let you know that I couldn't find anything here. It appears on the web. If it can, it'll come up with, okay, here's the stuff locally. And then there'll be a link down towards the bottom of the seat. And here's some things I found on the web that might be interesting. Oh, uh, yeah. Cool. And it does it really, really fast compared to what Windows Search used to be like. Nick, this is where you get to come in. Questions and answers. Nick, you had your hand up first. So I have my wonderful MacBook Pro. 15 incher I can get you more specifics if you want it's got a HDMI output plug that into my projector in my classes everything goes up on the screen life is good plug the HDMI cable into the input on my TV it says no signal plugged it into the input on the front panel of my DVD player it said no signal what's up baby what's up the configuration is it because somebody doesn't like me i'm i'm guessing if it works for the projector which uh -huh. is just a direct one yeah. input device that your other devices have may have multiple inputs oh, oh and, that's and it not it's not you know have you have to switch it to the correct yes port. so what? we tried it we tried it on input one which it says in the plastic of the case of the tv and it says on the screen we went to input two, selected input two. Mm. We selected input three, didn't work. We went to the front panel on the OPPO. We selected the HDMI front panel input. All of those came up, no signal. How old is the cable, HDMI cable you're using? Probably less than two years. It's the same one I use for the projector. How and it's younger than the computer. That's exactly what I was doing, except I was saying other things that we don't do on PG shows. The only thing I can think of is that your HDMI cable may be missing a pin that is required by you. Are, are your two new devices, your TV set and your DVD player, rather new? Are they less than a year old? Uh, no. And that wouldn't be it. Nick, you've got me stumped on this one. <gasps> does, that mean free, does that mean free membership for a year? 
No. Is this this is not the stump the experts episode. Yes, yes. That's in a couple of months. We're working on that. Oh, one. Great. Um, I have did you did you look I... in system preferences, Nick, on the Mac under displays when you had it plugged into the other devices to see if the Mac could actually see those the DVD player or the television set? No. So look under system preferences display. Yeah. Okay, it, I will do that. And I'll try, we tried two different HDMI cables, both of which I know work because both of them have worked with the projector. None of the devices are, the, the Oppo is several years old. The TV is maybe 10 years old. That one has got me in displays, check and find out if the um if the if the device is showing up at all which we, which device the tv or the tv and, and the dvd player when you have it plugged in you may have to select the device from that preference in order to get the output to go it may not be automatic but or I, you may even may even try restarting the uh, macbook pro it could be just needs some some pipe yeah. cleared because i used to have that problem when I, I when i was teaching down at uh our meetings were at the fairfield inn if i used the big tv set there i'd have to restart the mac in order for it to sync so that's another okay. possibility would you recognize recommend doing that with the hdmi cable plugged in to yes the absolutely then restart the mac? right other than that i've got nothing mike you got anything carolyn <laughs> Yeah, I do, because I have this really, really old ancient computer that I put into, um, it's an actually HDMI, well, it's, well, it's not actually HDMI, however, here it is, it's an HDMI cable, and I have to put a, like a, this adapter on, and whether I have the adapter on or not, when I plug it in, I have to have everything plugged up or I have to have the um, monitor plugged up and turned on before I turn the computer on. If I turn the computer on first and then try plugging it in, then it won't connect. It'll say cannot find device. But if I bring up the monitor first and then plug it and I have to have it plugged into the computer and then bring the computer up, then it works. The computer has to be the last thing I bring up. Otherwise it will yeah. not connect to the monitor. So that, that probably will make it work, Nick. Okay, I've got all it. I've got this all written down as notes. So stay tuned. Something to, to live through till February four. Any other questions, computer related? And thank you. Our pleasure, Nick. That's what we're here for. Nobody else has got a question. Now our term of the month is related to our actual meeting and computer maintenance. And one of the things we decided to do that's really important is for everybody to understand what we're talking about when we say computer maintenance. And I got this from Wikipedia. It's the practice of keeping computers in a good state of repair. And under that, it refers to components such as keyboards, monitors, tracking devices, data, backing stuff up, software, OS updates and applications, and security passwords. And so what we're going to do today is something a little bit different than we normally do that after we take the break, we're going to come back and we're going to do this as a round robin. Each of the officers, um, starting with Mike, so what we're going to do is go through and tell everybody on each of the topics and discuss each of these on how we do it. Now, you're going to find that we have a lot of similarities and a lot of differences. Some things would be very appropriate to what you're doing. Some may not be. We're going to take a five-minute break so everybody can go get coffee. Okay, folks, it's time to get started again. Brady, you have your hand up? Well, yeah, it, uh, it was really a question not related to uh, computer maintenance, but uh, I'm having trouble logging in to the state's site to register for the vaccinations. Uh, it's requiring me to change my password to my email account, and I don't want to do that. I just changed it last week and everything's working fine. I can go to Cox and immediately get in. And I don't understand why the state's site would say they won't accept my my password and to change it. Uh, Fred, let me, can I ask you, um, 
are you talking about the vaccination registration? Yes, I am. I, I saw a note, I didn't see this on the state, but I saw a note on the Cochise County's registration. If you are using a Cox email address, they it won't work. I don't know why oh, really? it didn't say. So you have to use a different email address than a Cox ISP email address. I don't know how to do that. I don't have any other accounts. You have an Apple ID? Yeah, I have or an you, Apple ID. Then you have an iCloud.com email address, whether you know it or not. So you just have to activate it and then you can use it. So how do I do that? You'll have to go to, uh, let's see, Apple ID dot Apple dot com and log in to your Apple ID and there'll be a way to get to some settings that, where you can uh, turn a switch that says, yes, I want an email address. What, I wonder why, why the uh, uh, prohibition of using Cox. Uh, My I mean, guess it has something to do with Cox and not the county <laughs> or the state. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I've had major, uh, Cox and I don't have a good relation, so. <laughs> Okay, thank you. I'm sorry to interrupt the. Oh flow. no, no. No, that's a good question. That's an excellent question. Well, well we're going to get started. The first topic we're going to talk about is physical maintenance. Things like dusting and cleaning the outside of your hardware, cleaning keyboards, cleaning screens, and basically, how often do you do it, and what do you do it with? Let's start off with Mike. Alrighty. I think this is probably. Uh appropriate. I think I may be one of the only ones that actually have a traditional desktop computer as opposed to a uh, laptop or a sealed system uh, that makes maintenance a lot easier. We live in a really dusty environment and dirt inside computer systems really don't play very well. Uh, I, my main desktop system that I'm on right now is actually about seven to eight years old. It's a custom built gaming system that I had built that was ridiculously overpowered. So it's even adequate even today uh, for most things. Uh, and it is one of the systems I actually have to take apart and dust occasionally. Even if you don't have that kind of system, you still have to uh, dust the outsides uh, of the keyboards, the screens and, and whatnot. And I happen to have gathered together the uh, materials I actually use for that. For screens, you don't want to use a tr traditional household cleaner. Uh, ammonia and bleach and that kind of thing does not work pleasantly with non-reflective surface or anti-glare coatings. So you want something that will be uh, gentle to a screen. I actually found something on Amazon called, yeah, Screen Mom. Mom, as in M-O-M? Screen Mom as an M O M. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and this is supposed to be one of the odor streak, odor free, streak free, ammonia free, alcohol free, phosphate free, and anti static. And I just use that along with a microfiber cloth. Don't ever, uh, by the way, spray directly onto the screen, spray it on the cloth and use that. And this works very nicely. I use it both for the screens and for the surface uh, of my uh, devices. Uh, something else I find that comes in handy, uh, you want to be careful with dusting, especially with like a vacuum cleaner or something like that. Uh, you don't want to uh, have static buildup, a static electric buildup. Uh, one thing that actually works well, I have an ostrich feather duster. The thing about using an ostrich feathers for dusting is the natural oils of the feathers tend to make them anti-static. And if you're driving between Tucson and Phoenix and stopping at Rooster Cogburn's Ostrich Ranch, they sell these. I actually also have a traditional feather duster from the same place. So this works well for the occasional dust off of the keyboard. All right, when you get into the keyboard itself, there's nothing like compressed air. Just a little bit of air that you can uh, blow through. Use this for both the keyboard and for the inside of my system. Uh, and it helps get the, the little crumbs and things that accumulate in the keyboard away. I remember hearing years ago that it's actually possible to take a keyboard, an attachable keyboard, and put it in a dishwasher. Uh, 
and then dry it out thoroughly. I've never been brave enough to try it, so you're on your own on that one. As far as my desktop system goes, I do have to occasionally take it out, take it apart, and uh, blow out the dust that accumulates. This can be a real issue. If you let dust accumulate to a certain point, dust does a very good job of holding in heat. If your power supply gets a good coat of dust on it, it's going to start getting hot. And a symptom of an overheating power supply is that your system starts shutting off periodically when it overheats, uh, it acts erratically. So keeping it dust free is a good method of doing this. My PC is a different form factor for most. It's an elongated uh, rectangle. It brings in air from the bottom where it's sitting. It's on a base that's about three inches high. And it brings in air from that base through a fan and then blows it up through uh, the top. Occasionally, I have to take it and remove the side. And I take the compressed air and I blow out the dirt on all three fans. I have three fans in this beast. This was the gaming computer that I could get just before I had to go to a liquid cooled system. So it has three fans for cooling. Also, I have a gaming video card that has its own fan in there. So I have to blast air through that as well. And then I blast air. By the way, I take this thing outside on a table because I don't want to uh, create this big cloud of dust in my house. So I'll blow out uh, the three fans that are there. Uh, the fan that's on the uh, graphic card. And then I'll give it a good squirt over other components like the memory chips, uh, being careful not to actually touch anything. Now, the thing about using compressed air like this is that you don't want to uh, tip it upside down. If you do, you're going to start blowing out liquid. Also, after you've used it for a few seconds, it will start refrigerating. It'll start getting very, very cold. I actually keep about three or four of these on uh, hand. And when I'm doing this, I'll use one for a few seconds until it starts uh, spitting, and then I'll switch to another one. And I'll go, I'll just rotate them through until I'm finally finished. You can buy like six packs of these uh, for fairly cheap on Amazon. How often should you do this? I would say ideally, probably quarterly. How often do I do it? I'm like, if I do it annually, <laughs> so far I'm getting away with it most of the time. So I did get that blue screen of death and I'm way overdue. So hey, maybe that had something to do with it. Otherwise, that's basically what I do for, for physical maintenance. I think that's about it for that. Any questions on, on doing any of that stuff? Mike, yeah. Mike um, you, you were talking about that uh, screen, Mom. What about using a regular lens cleaner like you'd use for cleaning glasses? Interesting you should mention that. I just purchased uh, another uh, lens cleaner for my glasses. And yeah, I would think that in most cases uh, that would be useful. Matter of fact, when I was running low on it, I was figuring I could use this on my glasses as well. When I was ordering lens cleaner, I did find that the lens cleaner I got in the reviews, a lot of people commented that this is the only lens cleaner that actually says that it's a safe for reflective coatings. Apparently there are other lens cleaners out there that have warnings, mm -hmm. don't use them on anti-glare or anti-reflective oh. uh, uh, coatings. So you have to be careful for that. I, can, I, can I would think that by and large you can do it. Um, yeah, I can answer that one. The lens cleaner has three things that reason you should not use it. One, it may not be good for reflective coatings. Two, it is not antibacterial, which the other ones are, because you can get bacteria growth on screens. What was the third one? And but well, some uh, glass cleaners also have alcohol. Yeah. Um, you should use a cleanser that is designed specifically for computer use. The, the one that Mike uses, the one I use is iClear. I-K-L-E-A-R. I've been using that for years. And it's um, like Mike, I do just about the same thing. Um, but one of the nice things about the closed keyboards and iPads and iPhones is that you have surfaces that are very easy to clean. Mm. I normally use a soft cloth every day um, on my iPhone and iPad. On my computer desktop screen, I'll clean that about once a week, maybe once every other week, mainly because I get it dirty. But the one thing I do want to point out, 
that I didn't even think about until Mike brought it up. I used to have the same problem you did with dust in the house. All, I mean, it just layers of it. And then at the recommendation of my allergy doctor, I put in a, a HEPA air filter. Since then, we have almost no dust in the house. Rarely have to dust the computer components. And we used to have, you know, thick dust on the TV stands and on the TV. Now, it used to be every week we would have to dust. Now, once a year, just to go over it with a feather duster, and that's it. No more dust on the fan, um, fan blades. Pet hair in a desktop computer that has a fan on it can be deadly. So make sure if, you're, if you can open your computer to look on the inside of it, then you need to make sure that you do not have dog hair, cat hair, dust on the inside of the computer. If you have a computer that cannot be opened, then if you have a fan on the computer, make sure that that fan vent is clean. And I think everything else is about what Mike and I both do pretty much the same thing, except that the, the filter, the air filter was just a godsend. And like I said, I use iClear. Make sure you do use a liquid that is designed for computer screens. The iPads and iPhones are glass. So you can use just about anything on those. Um, computer screens, different story. Okay, Barry, you have a question or comment? Yeah. Well, I, I don't, uh, the, you know, the iPads and iPhones have that oleophobic coating. I don't think you want to use just anything. I think there's still some salt, you know, there's some cleaners that will damage that. So I would still use a, a screen cleaner designed for screens, yeah. even on I, iPad. I use water. Or just plain, or just plain water, as I say, just yeah. plain water on a microfiber cloth. Uh, we had another question. Yeah, I was just saying, when you talk about a filter, you're talking about an actual uh, HEPA filter on your uh, a furnace or air conditioning. Uh, no, in this case, I have an actual air filter. It's a, it's a stand. It's about yay tall with a HEPA filter built into it. It's sitting in the uh, family room because I found the one on the air conditioning unit doesn't do it worth a damn. I put this one in and ran about 100 bucks, and it is so good. My daughter now uses one in her house. I'm getting ready to buy two more to put in the back bedroom, which is still a dust magnet. So it's sold as an air purifier? Yeah, air purifier. Yeah, that's what I was, yeah. The, I don't even remember the brand name, but it's it's one, the Amazon recommendation, air purifier with a HEPA filter. And I change filters out about once a quarter. Yeah, in fact, I can tell when the filter needs to be changed because all of a sudden my allergies kick back in because <laughs> I have, I'm allergic to dust mites and this gets rid of it. Uh, Carolyn's up next. Do you have any, anything to add? <laughs> Actually, yeah, for me, I don't really use desktops. I always use laptops and I'm dragging them all over the house so they have little time to even get dust on them. But when I do dust them, I just use like what Mike was showing, you know, one of those feather dusters. And let me see. Yeah, they do. The only desktop I do have is a Mac, but it's one of those ones where everything's built in. You can't take it apart. The monitor's built onto the CPU. So, you know, again, I just take a, a feather duster. And that's pretty much how I physically clean my computers. Okay, great, Barry. Yeah, I don't have uh, much more to add either. Uh, good recommendations by everybody so far. I also use, uh, there's some other uh, screen cleaner products that I can recommend. One's called Woosh, W-H-O-O-S-H. I believe it's an Amazon uh, favorite. I got it there for uh, uh, tech hygiene, they call it for screen. I use it for screening or cleaning all surfaces, not just the glass. Uh, mm -hmm. Same advice, put it on, a rat, on the, uh, the other part of your computer. There's another one I got called Juice. And uh, it's kind of a, a funny tongue in cheek thing because it's apple scented, so. It's sold to be for Apple devices. 
you know, it, it, it's it's designed for for tech devices too. So those are a couple other brands that, uh, in addition to what Mike and John have shared. Um, as far as dusting, yeah, I don't have a feather duster, but I do use uh, a, like a Swiffer duster to dust my desk and t uh, top side surfaces of, of things sitting on the desk. I don't use it to, to, to dust the computers themselves or the, or the monitors or the screens, but uh, um, I do uh, I will have uh, some in dust that I may spray on them occasionally. And in dust does make a, uh, a uh, product to be used with electronics specifically to cut down on static as well as to, you know, pull off the dust off of a electronic device. So we have some of that and I'll use that to dust like the v the uh, DVD players and the TV, not the screen, but the uh, TV base and stuff like that. I do uh, want to circle back though to what I was telling Fred prior to going into this first uh, topic under computer maintenance in regards to iCloud uh, mail. Uh, I, I made a mistake. You don't have to go to your Apple ID, log in at Apple, I, it's your Apple ID with, at the Apple website to do that. You actually set it up on your device directly. So if you don't have an iCloud email address that you're using, you just go on your iPhone, iPad, or Mac to your iCloud settings. And under mail, there's a, a switch to turn it on. And then you just follow the on-screen prompts to set up your email address. And you and that's all you have to do. So you, you don't Very, have to go through their you website. Give me your information. I went back into that website, and when it asked me to change my password, I created a new password, and it worked. I, and I'm still using Cox, but I, oh. I don't know why it worked, but it worked. And so I'm at a point now where I have to go. When we take a break, I've got to go look at uh, my Medicare card and see what the number is and put that in. But it uh, went through a series of questions of, do you work for the government? Do you work for anything in the health industry? Blah, blah, blah. Do you deal with students? Do you live in a rest home or a assisted mm -hmm. living facility? Uh, a lot of things like that. And ask your age, are you over 75, which I am. And then you have to go down to a point where it says, do you have insurance? And I and, uh, said, so I had Medicare. And uh, then it wants your Medicare number, but I don't have my card right here with me. So I'm going to do that on the break. But it did let me in. Uh, oh, great. It just created a new password. Okay. The next thing we're talking about is restarting your computer. Yeah. We're going to do just this, just that topic. Then we're going to come up to backup strategies. It's going to start off with me this time and end with Mike. And we're going to rotate these each time. Restarting it. So everybody understands, and this is Windows as well as Mac, but not so much to your iOS and Android devices, that you really should restart your computers, this is laptops and desktops, at least weekly. Now, why is this? The Especially on the Mac, and if you're using Linux, there are certain housekeeping routines that only run weekly and monthly but they won't run unless you restart the computer. It's a part of the startup. If, if you don't run these, is it gonna hurt your computer? No, it'll just make things work better. Windows has the same routines. Also, it helps anytime you get a system crash, always restart your computer to clear out the buffers so everything is working right. I have a, a reminder set up that once a week, Monday morning, I always to tell me to restart the computer. That is, unless I've had to restart it during the week. On my iPhone and iPad, I recommend at least monthly, if not more often. Um, it just helps clear everything out if you've got a stuck process. If you've had an application crash on you, then I definitely would suggest doing that because you may the memory may be corrupted. So it, it, there's no harm in it. I would do it at least weekly on all devices if you can. But on your laptops and desktops, running Mac OS or Windows, try and do it at least weekly, and you'll see the things run a lot better. Okay, um, Carolyn, 
you're up next. Okay. Um, again, I mainly only use a laptop. So of course I reboot my computer every day. When I go to bed at night, I turn my computer off. And then I also have the iMac desktop, but I use that for um, watching videos because I'm getting into art and music. So I watch the videos in the room where the Mac is because that's where all my equipment is. And, but I don't do that every single day. So again, when I want to use my Mac, I'll turn it on when I'm going to use it. Then I turn it off at the end of the day. So that goes. And then again, my iPad and my iPhone actually do mostly stay on, except when there's an upgrade. Of course, you do have to reboot it. So, and my iPhone sometimes is old. So sometimes it has problems. So I'm usually rebooting my iPhone about once every week or so. So that's how I handle rebooting. Okay, well, I, was, I, I need to make a statement. Thank you for reminding me. My desktop stays on 24 seven. So that's why you know, if you shut your computer down at night, then you're rebooting it. So you don't have to worry about that. It's for the people that leave their devices like my iPhone never shuts off ever. In fact, sometimes it doesn't even go to sleep. It has to but when you ahead. upgrade it. Pardon? When it has updates, you have to reboot it. That's very true. <laughs> uh, those are not weekly, thank goodness. Um, so if, if your devices are not running 24 seven, then you don't have to worry about it. It's for the devices that you do run and going to sleep is not the same as restarting as two totally different things. So just because your screen has gone blank, doesn't mean your computer is off. We're talking about going and doing a restart or a power down. Now with that in mind, I always like about once a month, and there, I have no justification for this, I like to power down and start back up from scratch. Because there is a difference between restarting and power downing. Because the restart, some of the buffers are not cleared. On a power down, they definitely are. And especially on mine, in which I have a battery backup, even if I lose power, I don't get a restart. Um, let's go on to Barry's next. Anything to add? I, like John, leave my devices on 24-7 and only restart when it becomes necessary. Like Carolyn mentioned, there's a software update that requires a restart. On iOS devices, You, it'll automatically do that for you as part of the updating process, so you don't have to manually restart. But also, if there's you know misbehaving software that uh, needs to be cleared out of the pipes, out of the memory pipes, uh, I'll uh, restart. Those maintenance scripts that John talks about uh, for the Mac specifically, though some of those won't run. However, I do have other utilities that I use for maintenance that we'll probably talk about in one of the later topics if we get that far, um, that run those maintenance scripts for me without having to restart. So I don't worry about those uh, uh, having to restart regularly to have those actually run because I have other utilities that do it for me. But I will speak a little bit more specifically about this new M1 Apple Silicon Mac Mini I have because it's new, it's newer hardware. We're uh, transitioning from Intel-based software over to you know, a new code base for the Apple Silicon. There's uh, applications that haven't been uh, updated by their developers yet to be native on this new platform. And they're running in uh, translation mode. They're translated by Apple's technology called Rosetta 2 so that they will run uh, in the Apple Silicon environment. So there's so there's some kind of a little bit of glitchiness sometimes, a little unstable, depending on the application, depending on how things are behaving. You know, I've followed some people that are, you know, that got these machines early as well, you know, podcasts and so forth. And I find my experience to, to mirror theirs in that and recommending regular restarts just to keep things cleared out, keep the pipes clean a little bit uh, more often. And I found that I do uh, on occasion 
need to restart the, the Mac Mini more often. And I have, like John says, he does uh, have a reminder to, or try to, or try to remember if I don't have it set, to restart this Mac Mini probably at least once a week at the beginning of the week before I start any major production work with it because uh, it's you know it's a new new platform in a way and not everything is up to snuff so it just helps keep it running a little bit better if it's restarted more more often that's my okay my my plan already <laughs> well like Carol and I run a laptop uh, in the evenings uh, and that I'll just shut off when I go to bed at night uh, the desktop I'm on right now, like uh, the other folks, I keep it running 24 seven, uh, primarily so that it can perform backups uh, in the evening. Then there's also the debate about, is it more wear and tear on electric components uh, if you set them off early or if you just keep them running? And that was a religious war back in the day that you could get into a fight over. Uh, I, I just keep mine running. I try to remember to reboot mine about once a week or so. Windows 10 is really pretty stable, uh, aside from that one blue screen of death I just had. Uh, I usually wind up rebooting it about every two to three weeks for the simple reason. Uh, my graphics card, it is a gamer card, and they come down with new drivers uh, fairly frequently. And I have found that I really can't reinstall drivers uh, when I'm on a user account. So I will sign out of my user account and actually log into my admin account so I can do those, uh, those upgrades, those updates to the drivers, and then I'll do a restart. And like I said, that's about every two or three weeks uh, where that happens. And that seems to keep me in, in pretty good shape. Like everybody else, I'd say probably about once a week is a good, uh, a good restart schedule. Okay, now let's move on to the next topic, backup strategies. We're going to start off with Carolyn. Okay, I'm first. Okay, so my backup strategies is I use OneDrive. I have that installed on my Surface. And so I actually use OneDrive so I can get my thing, no matter which system I'm on, I can always access all of my files. So that's the main thing that I use. But we also have an external drive that our network connects to. It's just an external drive connected to the network. It isn't connected to any computer. And that's where I actually back up and archive all my stuff. So I actually have the one drive and I got that external hard drive. And also even on my Surface, I will back up files on my Surface also. So I usually have three copies of any one file at any one time. So that's my backup strategy. Okay. Barry, you're next. I'm next. Okay. Well, I try, um, I for years have ascribed to uh, a backup strategy that we actually shared with the group in a previous Mike and Barry show, I don't know, some months or years or decades ago, whatever it was, <laughs> <laughs> um, called the three, two, one strategy, where I've, I have at least three copies of everything, but I, at least everything that I want to protect from uh, losing. Uh, I use two at least two different media, in other words, two different storage devices, and whether that's a uh, internal, you know, drive or and external drives or uh, some kind of disk uh, media, and one copy offsite. So three copies, two media, one one of those three copies uh, offsite somehow, whether it's on a disk in another location or in the cloud. Things have changed in regards to my specific implementations over the years, depending on the computers I've had and what hardware I have. My current setup, especially with this new M1 Mac Mini has changed a, uh, a little bit. Two, two of my copies that I usually try to keep, uh, two out of the three, one would be a time machine backup and the second one would be <laughs> a um, a cloned drive uh, or a dr an external drive that has a clone of my boot system of my main system so that if something happened to my internal drive i could immediately boot to the clone and keep working and then address the the failure or the problem 
when I have more time to give it. Uh, however, Big Sur running on M1 Mac is still uh, the, the uh, software developers that make the software to make clones uh, have not caught up yet. <laughs> so I don't have a clone, but uh, I do have a time machine backup for everything on this M1 Mac. I have an external hard drive for extra storage uh, connected to it. And then I have a, a second external drive of the same size uh, that I do clone as a backup for that external storage um, uh, that's on uh, that's not on the internal. I do use Apple's documents and desktop in the cloud or in iCloud on all uh, my user accounts on all my Macs. Uh, including uh, a MacBook Air that we ha have from uh, 2018. So I have access to all my main documents um, and any files on my desktop on any device through iCloud. And so there's a copy in the cloud. So that's my offsite for most of those things. And my photo library also is turned on iCloud Photos. Uh, so that I have copies of my photos in the cloud, uh, 20,000 plus photos and videos. Uh, I have them downloaded to one Mac, all the originals, and every other Mac is set to optimize storage for uh, documents, desktop, and photos so that to save local storage space. That's basically it. My, uh, my wife has an iMac. I have her set up with an external drive that has two volumes, one for Time Machine and one for a clone because it's an older operating system. I just recently upgraded the a MacBook Air that I'm using for this uh, session because my Mac Mini doesn't have a, a webcam. I, have, I used to have a clone on an SSD and a Time Machine on an SSD for this machine. Uh, however, the clone is now frozen at the last installation of Catalina I was running before upgrading to Big Sur last weekend. So Big Sur backup on this machine is, is just the cloud and time machine. So I have a few things to address to get my 321 strategy back in place on all computers, but some of it's waiting for software developers to... Uh, work out the kinks with the new Apple hardware and Big Sur, and some of it's just spending some money to get some more external drives and figure out how I'm gonna connect them all and keep them powered and all that kind of thing. So that's how I approach my backups. Okay, great. Um, by the way, Ava, you had a question? Ava? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, yes, but you guys answered it. Well, ask it again so the whole group knows the answer. Oh, I didn't know what uh, surface meant. Okay, Carolyn, you want to answer that? Yeah, a surface is just a laptop, like John actually put up in the um, chat. It's a laptop, and it's kind of a combination between a laptop and a tablet, meaning you can actually detach the screen and use it as a tablet or you can put the screen back onto the keyboard and use it as a laptop. It's really, really thin and really, 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 really skinny and really, really light, but it's really, really powerful because I actually use this as a desktop. So it's a laptop that I use as my desktop. It's just as, it's like a kind of a PC computer name and it's called a Surface. That's just the name of the particular laptop. Okay, Mike. Yep. Carolyn mentioned uh, when she was talking about our external drive on the network. What that actually is, is a network attached storage device uh, from Western Digital called the MyCloud. And physically, it consists of three physical drives that appear to us as one large hard drive. Uh, the advantage of that is that if one of the physical drives goes out, uh, I will not lose data. I can replace that one drive and it can rebuild uh, the data I've got. It's called a RAID configuration. Uh, so that's what we use as our main uh, backup purpose. 
the way I do backups on my desktop is I'm still running what they call Windows 7 backup. Uh, that is still compatible with Windows 10. I keep meaning to change it out, and I probably will here in the next couple of weeks, I think. Uh, that has been replaced with Windows 10 by what they call file history, which, from what I could tell, is starting to look more like the way Time Machine works. And by the way, I still don't understand why nobody's come up with the Time Machine for, uh, for PC. I'm very jealous. Uh, as far as backup strategy goes, something I started doing uh, 30 years ago is I actually have one folder called data. And inside that is where I save everything. I have a lot of subfolders and that's where I save all my stuff. So when I run a backup, I just tell it to backup data. That's probably more complicated than it needs to be nowadays. Windows years ago started coming up with default document areas like documents where if you don't tell uh, an application uh, where to specifically put it, it's gonna put it in the documents folder. Uh, downloads has its own folder. Pictures has its own folder. So if you use that, uh, Windows backups want to just back those up automatically. So if you're starting out fresh, that's actually uh, an easy way to go. Online backups, I use Google Drive myself. Uh, I have my photos backed up to both Google Photos, which is going to be going away, I believe, uh, come summertime, uh, and also Amazon Photos, uh, which is a paid uh, service. Uh, my music systems, uh, I have it backed up here locally, and I also have that backed up on Amazon Music. Uh, Amazon has a service. It was Amazon Cloud, then they differentiated it. They specialized it down more. Uh, my personal music that I had before, I got grandfathered in. I think now with Amazon Music, you can only uh, store the music that you actually buy on Amazon, uh, and you'll, you'll get that for free. Uh, music, photos, to me, those are the biggies, uh, local storage. Yeah, that's basically all about all I do. Okay, now it's my turn. My backup strategies. And understand, I am a little paranoid about losing data. Um, at one time, I didn't have a good backup strategy, and it ended up costing me almost $3,000 to have a disk recovered. It had everything my entire life on it. So I do not recommend being this paranoid, but this is my backup strategy. First off, I use Time Machine. And Mike, the reason why Time Machine like is not available for Windows is it uses a Unix utility called, I believe it's called Sparse, which is a file compression technique that is unique to Unix. Not even uh, Linux has it. And that's how they are able to do what they do with Time Machine. I know there's people been trying to do it, but so far they haven't been able to um, emulate it. Um, yeah, Time Machine is really nice for backups. And then like Barry, I have a clone of my boot disk. I have that going all the way back to four operating system updates. And then because I've got five external hard drives, I use a program called Chronosync, which backs up every night all the changes on both my internal drive and all my external drives. That's on an eight terabyte drive. In addition- Where, where yeah. is it back? Where do you, where is that back up to, John? You got several I have an eight drives. terabyte drive that it backs up to. Oh, I see a separate eight terabyte yeah, drive that everything eight else terabyte goes. Drive. Plus I back up everything on that to a paid service called Backblaze. So I have got my original, a backup, a tertiary backup. So I can go, you know, if if I lose my eight terabyte drive, I can go to Backblaze and get all that. In addition to that, I have the iCloud backup of my documents and desktop where I keep really important stuff. And my photos, I have the photos backed up both to Backblaze and my external plus iCloud backup, plus Amazon backup, plus Google backup. I don't want to take any chances on losing photos again. So that's my backup strategy. And Backblaze, I think, is $79 a year. Um, Amazon comes with Amazon Prime. And Google, I did not know Google was disappearing, but that doesn't surprise me. When Google comes up with something good, they get rid of it after a year. 
Um, any questions on what I do? Moving right along then, let's go and storage management. We're going to start off with Barry's first. Oh, boy. Yes, you get to start off. <laughs> get to, and I get to answer the three questions, right? Yes. What does it mean? How does it differ on different platforms? And what should be deleted and why? Now, that's the really important one right there. It's all yours. Okay. Well, and we're getting close to break, so I'm not sure. We might not. I might not finish before the break, but or, or maybe we'll take a break right after. Um, what does storage management mean to me? Well, in general, I see, see storage management as managing <laughs> the file and folder hierarchy, including where where I save a file, whether it's internal drive, external drive, or a cloud service drive using those uh, default folders like Mike uh, uh, said that are in Windows, the documents, pictures, so forth. those are also part of Mac OS. Uh, when you have uh, set up a new user on, on, a Mac, on a Mac, you have a home directory that has folders already there for you to use for specific kinds of, of files, music, pictures, there's a downloads folder, as Mike said, your a documents folder, uh, a desktop folder. Uh, storage management also means to me, you know, moving files around when necessary to make more space. You know, managing how those, how how your disk space is used. In, in other words, so uh, if you have a boot volume that's getting too full, uh, managing those files and putting them on an external storage somehow to make more room is part of that process and moving infrequently used or very large files to archival external storage of some kind. All of that's part of it for me. Um, so how does it differ on different platforms? I can only speak mainly on to Apple devices. The only Windows device I, devices I use are from my employer and uh, I, won't, I won't talk about that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so on most of the Apple devices, uh, it's, it's very similar, uh, on iOS, of course, uh, you don't, you don't see the file folder structure that's there. They, uh, Apple obscures that from the user on, on purpose. They have from the very beginning, at some point they added the files app which allows you access to a folder file and folder hierarchy. And if you're using, as I and John have mentioned, documents and desktop in the cloud from our Macs, those same folders are also available on my iPhone and, and on an, an iPad that I will get in the future <laughs> um, in the files app in iOS. So I can access any file from that's on my Mac, on either of my Macs, on my iPhone, if I need to. Uh, it's just not the same uh, kind of access as, uh, as I can get on the, on the Mac directly in the Finder. Well, in addition, anything in iCloud Drive, even if it's in a different folder, can be uh, accessed on any device. Inclu and uh, that would also include my iCloud photo library. There's a, a nice little uh, setting on Macs and on iOS devices. I briefly mentioned it in my previous thing about uh, my backup strategy, but you can choose to optimize storage on any of your Apple devices. And I have that turned on on this laptop and on uh, all my mobile devices, my iPhone being the only one right now, but that means that the operating system has built in machine learning, artificial intelligence, whatever you want to call it, to watch how you use the machine and what files you're using, what files are large files and which files have not been accessed or used in a uh, you know, long period of time. And it will basically remove them from the local storage However, the icons are still there 
it looks like you have that file, but it's only in the cloud. Or in my case, it's only in the cloud and on my Mac mini, which has optimized storage turned off so that all my files are there for backing up locally, as well as having it in the cloud. The operating system does some storage management for me automatically on my iPhone and on this uh, MacBook Air. So I don't have to think about it as much. Um, and quite frankly, I don't create a lot of things on the MacBook Air, so I'm not adding a lot of new files. Uh, but my wife has started using this machine now for her podcasting because it's a newer operating system, a newer version of GarageBand. And she uses iCloud Drive for all her files for that. So, excuse me, they are saved locally here and in the cloud, but the operating system here will also, once she's finished and hasn't accessed or used those files in quite a while, it will offload them so that they saves internal space on this machine. So what should be deleted and why? Well, my first thought was, I'm a digital pack rat. I never delete anything. <laughs> but that's not totally true. <laughs> I do, I do tend to keep a lot of things I probably don't need to. <laughs> but some things I, I always delete now. I didn't used to do this, but I always delete installers. Once I've downloaded and installed something or updated an, an app, if an installer is left behind, I'll delete those. Uh, anything in my downloads folder, I tend to delete or if it's something I need to keep, obviously I'll move it out of my downloads folder and put it in some kind of folder uh, organization that I, that's appropriate for whatever the file is. Some things will be moved directly off to an external drive for archival storage and other things I'll have in my documents folder that's synced up to iCloud. Things that obviously are deleted for me are like when I take photos and I go through them on, on the Photos app on the Mac, I'll delete obviously bad ones. <laughs> Sometimes I'll even delete those right after I take them on, when I review them on the phone first. <laughs> so they don't get transferred to all my devices first. Um, or if I take a photo for a, some kind of short term reason then I'll del delete it after you know that term is over. As an example of being, uh, it hasn't happened really since the pandemic, but uh, going shopping and uh, having a list prepared uh, by my wife and being in the store and, and finding the product she wants. And there are seven different varieties or brands or something and I think, Okay, which one does she really want? So sometimes I'll just take a picture of the shelf and say, send message it to her and say, which one of these should I get? <laughs> so later I'll delete that photo when she's answered the question. <laughs> so <laughs> um, screenshots. I take uh, quite a few screenshots uh, over the period of a, a week or a month uh, for different reasons. And once I've used them, if it's not something that I think I'll refer to again, I'll delete it right away. Um, I do have a folder for screenshots. So if I'm answering a question from a, a client or a user that I'm helping uh, and it's something, oh, this is, a, this is a common procedure, I'll save those screenshots and uh, if someone asks it again, I'll have them, of course. Uh, when the operating system gets upgraded and it looks different or the process is different, then those have to be deleted and replaced. So there's not a lot of other things that I actively delete, uh, except for um, when we get to the next topic. But um, that's my answers to those questions. Any, any questions to those answers? Okay, yeah. hearing none, I'll, uh, yeah. I'll yield the floor to my esteemed colleagues. Okay. Um, Ava asked a question a while back that I want to get to. She asked about, has anyone ever had a black screen of death? Um, Ava, what operating system are you using? 
that you get that with? I didn't ask that question. Oh, Jane, I, I'm sorry, not Ava, Jane. I'm sorry, Jane asked the question. No problem. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was helping someone and it turned out that explored, Windows 10 explore.exe had somehow stopped during an update. And I researched it online and Mike was talking about using administrative privileges. You had to go out to task manager, run a command shell, and I forget what the command shell was now. Um, the article gave me a location for explore.exe, but I had to look around and find it. You right click on explore exe, restart it, then restart the laptop and it was fine. Oh, okay. But oh, okay. it was a black screen. <laughs> I know what it is then. I haven't seen it happen in a long time, but yeah, explorer.exe is actually the process that actually draws the desktop. And if that crashes, yeah, the screen just goes black and uh, a reboot will will take care of it. Ah, okay. And a what? I want a reboot? Re a reboot, just a reboot will do it. You can go in well, manually and find did, Explorer. I think they tried that. Yeah. I think they tried that and it didn't. Oh, okay. I haven't seen but it. We, oh, yeah, many. we resolved it. Good. Yeah, we resolved it. Okay. What I'm going to do now is before we move on to Mike, we're going to take our 10 minute break, our five minute break right now. Okay. Uh, Mike, it's your turn. All righty. Well, storage management, probably not the best person to talk about. I struggle with it all the time. Uh, I have a habit of, I like to have everything I'm working with right on my desktop. Uh, a friend of mine that I worked with once said that looks like I had early influence uh, from Apple where all the Macintosh you always used to be on the desktop. And that probably comes back from when I actually was working with Mac 2s back in 85, 86, 87, somewhere in there. Same time I was working with Windows 1.0, which is another story. So I have a tendency to uh, have all my files start to overrun my desktop. And every now and again, I'll try to stop and reorganize that. There used to be a real reason for doing that. Uh, drawing icons on a Windows desktop used to take up a fair bit of resources. Uh, it's not nearly as bad now, but I still try to keep it a little bit sparse, a little bit more organized. Uh, I mentioned that for my backups that for my own storage stuff, I tend to create one folder called data and then create subfolders within it. So I could just then drag the data uh, wherever I need it, back it off uh, to another drive. Um, uh, the current system I have, the desktop I have, actually has two hard drives on it. One is a, bearing in mind again, this is like a seven or eight year old system. Uh, the primary drive is only 250 gigs. It's an SSD solid state drive. Uh, the other drive is a terabyte uh, traditional hard drive. The problem I have with storage management is dealing with programs that really, really, really want to install themselves on the primary C drive. And I just don't have room for that. Uh, I will often, when I'm installing a new system, telling it, I want you to install to my D drive or e, actually E drive, which is my terabyte drive. Most Programs are all right with that. Some of them really, really fight you on that. They want to go on the C drive. One program I actually found that had a problem with that was iTunes. Back when I first dealt with this, iTunes really wanted to be in the C drive. I finally found a way where uh, I could arrange it where all my music actually went on the E drive and the iTunes control uh, program stayed on the C drive. And that was a, an acceptable uh, compromise. Uh, as far as uh, storage and deleting files, about once a quarter or so, I try to go through the uh, Windows uh, apps and features uh, settings in the control panel. And I'll go through and see all the uh, programs that I have installed and see if there's anything that I really don't use that I can uninstall and get rid of. I will say that Windows uh, 10 does do a pretty good job on uninstalling stuff. 
It doesn't seem to leave uh, too much uh, stuff behind, uh, unlike what it was years ago where you had bits and pieces all over the place. Uh, so that actually is, is pretty good. Uh, other than that, uh, I basically just deal with it uh, uh, as it comes. I try to keep where I can, uh, where I can find things. Well, one thing I was going to mention is uh, something like what Barry mentioned with Mac. Windows does by default hide a number of system files uh, from you. You can go in and change that under the uh, folder options. You can tell it to view all files. Uh, you probably don't want to do that unless you actually really have a compelling reason to go find a system file. The reason they're hidden is users normally don't have any reason to play with them. And I tell you what, if you view all the files, you're going to be amazed at how many files are on that system. And most of them you don't really want to mess around with. So, but sometimes, sometimes you need to do that. Um, actually, I think that's about all I got. I don't really think anything else there, John. Okay, well, now it's up to me. Um, pretty much what Barry said is what I do. You know, storage management to me is, and it's a little bit different from Barry, is organizing my files so I can find something, which is primarily on Mac OS. On iPad OS and iOS, or the iOS devices, I really don't even think about it anymore. It, it's the way it's set up is when I need a file, I'm in the application and it's there, um, which I really like. I wish the desktop apps would get more to that. Um, well, Carolyn's disagreeing with me. <laughs> um, see, I haven't had any issues. Um, when I need to find something, I go into the app and it's there. His, I mean, even files that I haven't touched in a long time, I can still get to easily. But on my uh, under the Mac OS and under Windows, I have to set up hierarchies, figure out where I'm going to put stuff, and it's notorious for not being able to find stuff. But what I do use is a capability of Spotlight, which is a search routine on Mac OS and on iOS, because not only will it find me files with the name of the file, but also words that are in the file that it could read. So that saved me quite a bit on being able to find stuff because I couldn't remember what I called it. On iOS devices, I really don't even think about it anymore. I just do the work. I know what should be deleted. Well, like Mike, and I think about once a quarter, I go through and like Barry, I go to my downloads folder and make sure that gets cleaned out, which I'm still working on. Um, go through and I've got a utility that shows me you know, files I have not used in a certain amount of time. So I look at anything that's over two years old. Do I really need to keep that? And you'd be surprised. Also look at big files. I do a lot of video work. And sometimes the temporary files that get created for video don't get removed. So I look at those. Uninstalling applications is the big area where we're talking about that separately. But go through and find out, you know, like photos. Like I think all of us have mentioned, you know, go through photos that I don't need anymore. Now, this brings up something which most people don't know. If you send photos through Messenger on your phone, this is for iPhone users, that that photo is separate from all other photos. And you need to go in and delete that specifically because it will take up storage space. So I said, you know, my my wife will send me photos all the time when she's out shopping, or if I'm out shopping, I'll send photos to her of stuff to buy. That those are stored in Messenger. <clears throat> if you send people photos of whatever in Messenger, those are separate from the ones in email and in the Photos app. So you need to go in and remove those specifically because they can start to eat up space yeah barry you're talking about the messages app that apple provides or yes 
the messages okay. app Apple provides. Okay. Because the Facebook text app is called Messenger. Yes. So I'm I just want to make sure message. I had the right one. It used to be iMessage. Messages. Now, right. Yeah. Okay. If you delete it on your iPhone and you have it sunk through the cloud, it may not necessarily delete off of your Mac or your iPad. So you need to go in and check and make sure that it's deleting off across all devices. If you delete the conversation, it's gone off of all devices, but not necessarily the photos. I discovered that when I started to run out of room on my iPad, I couldn't figure out why. That's because messages was taking up almost two thirds of the space. That's all I have on that topic. Okay, yes. Carolyn, it's your turn. I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. Yes, and on the, uh, I'm just going to say how how John doesn't like the whole file structure thing. He'd just rather have the name. First of all, I can never name remember the name. And yes, you do have the thing where you can find stuff inside a file. Like I'll search quadratic equation because I know something was about a quadratic equation, and I'll have like a hundred files that way. I like to be able to go down to my coaches folder, the class number and whatever, and then I can find my file. So that's just why I like that kind of, I love the file structure. And my storage management is about organizing with a file structure. I'm from the old world where I worked in an office and we had an actual file cabinet. And so that's how my brain thinks. <laughs> so that's what I think about when I think file structure and how I use it is I use OneDrive. The reason I use OneDrive is it looks the same no matter which device you use. I can even install the app on my Mac and then I can go into OneDrive and that OneDrive looks exactly like it does on my Surface laptop. So that's what I use as my management thing. So I only really have to go to one place for my managers, you see. Oh, yeah, I hate the way that iOS hides the file structure for me, what I just said. I just can never find things that way. Oh, and uh, from you can to... You can add your OneDrive to the Files app in iOS, and you'd have the same access from any app on, I, on your iPad or iPhone <coughs> in addition to what the OneDrive app. Oh, I know, but somehow, sometimes I just don't like the way that they structure it. It doesn't look the same on every single device. I like wanting to look at something and have it look the same because I have a right. PC and I have a Mac and I want everything to look the same regardless on which device I'm on. <laughs> and sometimes if I use some of the other things, they don't look the same on every single device and I get confused real easy. But anyhow, <laughs> on deleting is yes, with the whole downloads thing. If I download something, I immediately put it into my file structure where I want it to be, if that's appropriate. If it's something that's downloaded for a temporary thing, I, I, I actually, I delete it right away. So, and after I take something out of the downloads file and put it where it needs to be on my computer, I just delete everything in the downloads file. I don't like things being in my downloads file. <laughs> Now let's see what else do I have here. Oh yeah, and storage management also, when I have files, if it's something I use all the time, I have it in my file structure. If it's something like after a semester ends, then I take it and I archive it onto the separate hard drive that we have connected to our network. So that's the other management thing. If I don't need it anymore, it comes off my devices and goes into permanent storage. And so that's pretty much how I handle management. Okay, any questions for the four of us on this? Moving right along. I have a oh, quick question. She's got her hand up there, sure. uh, John. Okay. I have a question. Where do all these things that we delete go? <laughs> okay. Um, I'll give you the, the, the quick answer. When you delete a file, what it really does is changes a flag on that file that says, I am no longer visible. The data is still there. Now, what happens is, is the file, the flag is set saying, I'm no longer visible. This space is available to be used again by something else. So and until the operating system overwrites that data, that data is still there. So the file doesn't move at all. 
it just stays right there. It's just no longer visible. And the operating system is told this space is available. Now, but under Windows, you, a lot of you will run the command to, um, and if you do a defrag in Windows, it will use, you know, compress all that space. The Mac doesn't have anything like that because the operating system does that automatically. So that's what happens when you delete a file that all that really happens is the file, the data, the information is still there. It just sets a flag saying, don't show me. And this space is available for use. But, but Gene brought up what, a good point too, though, that first it goes into your recycle bin and then you have to empty the recycle bin because and even then you're right, it's not really history, but yeah. while it's sitting in your recycle bin, it's still taking up room on your computer. Yes. And on photos <laughs> and photo applications, if you delete a photo, it goes into a special folder called deleted photos and it stays there for 30 days until you go through and very consciously remove the files, which is nothing more than saying, hey, I really do not want this file. I really, really don't. So don't show it to them anymore. Pretend like it's not there. It's going to stay there and take up room. But once you do delete it, it's actually, you can actually go in and in many cases do an undelete if you do it quickly enough and the file is recovered. If you wait too long, it may not be there or it can't be recovered. Does that answer the question? Yes. Another question though. Yes. Uh, um, I have a MacBook Pro. Do I have a recycle bin that I don't know about? Yours is called a trash bin. Oh, okay. it's trash. Yeah, on Windows the Mac OS, trash is, is the same thing as recycle bin on Windows. So it works yeah. the same way. As long as it's still in your trash, Gene, you have access to it. You can pull it back out and put it back in your file structure if you want. But when you empty the trash, that's when what John explained goes into effect. It flags the files as invisible. I can use this space again. Thank you. Maureen? Yes, if I have a, um, I have a, a bunch of files on the front of my desktop that I would like to um, go through, edit, uh, clean it up. And I don't know how to move something from the desktop just back into documents. Or if I delete something on the desktop, does it just stay in documents? Okay, for, uh, before we answer that, what program are you using to put the stuff on your face? Oh, that's, um, uh, let me lower my hand. And if you go to stop video or start video where the virtual background is, it says choose a video filter. Really? And, and there are background and filters. And so you can have a hat on, you can have lollipops. You can have a mustache. Yes, yeah, built into Zoom. Is it called Studio Effects or, or really? No, if you're um, where it says stop and start video on the bottom left. Yeah, I didn't know about this till Nick brought it to my attention. So, if you're, I'm on a Windows laptop and I tried choose filter and it asked me if I wanted to download the filters package. Ah. So, so you must uh -huh. have to download something first to have access to them. Well, if you if you click on that to uh, John or whoever else is um, wondering on, when, in the Zoom, when you clicked on uh, the filters, did when you went to set, because that ought to take you to settings, and in settings that starts with general video, audio, share screen, background and filters. Is background and filters where you are? Can you ask your question again? Because I'm not really yeah. sure I understood it. Yeah, I have a bunch of, of folders that I've made I have uh, on my desktop. Right. And um, some of them, well, this part doesn't matter. I want to um, 
have some of them go just back to documents. I don't want them sitting on my desktop. Right. So I don't know how to cause that. I want them on my computer. I want to be able to go find them, but I don't want them sitting here on my desktop. You click and drag it to the documents folder. You open the doc you open the window for the documents folder. And if your desktop, you just take that folder and drag it into that window. So open finder as it is what yeah, you're open saying. the finder. And in uh, no documents. It, ah, it went into it didn't open documents, it um, added it to the recents. Yeah, but just just maneuver over to documents. Yeah. Let me try that again. Okay. Okay. Got now it. For your desktop, just drag it into that window. I did. I did. Okay. okay. Thank you. That was easy. Okay. Uh, Carolyn, we're done. Let's go to our next topic. Removing duplicates. Carolyn, Mike, we start off with you. Uh, this is going to be fast and easy. I really don't have a problem with, uh, uh, with duplicates at all. Uh, the only time I'll see it is if I'm downloading something that I forgot I downloaded. And when I start to save it, I'll notice that, uh, in the file name, it'll have a little parentheses two parentheses, uh, in there to indicate that the file already exists. It'll uh, automatically rename it to that. Uh, other than that, I, I really don't have a problem uh, with with duplicate files. Oh, you are so lucky. <laughs> you are so lucky. Okay. Um, I've got end up with duplicates all over the place because I create photos. I'll create duplicates of the folders, uh, files to work on. Um, when I was teaching classes, I'd have multiple copies of syllabuses. Um, and make copies of stuff. And what I did is that um, I would go through, I, I have a program called Gemini 2 that goes through and finds duplicates of every file by name and shows me the date on it. And then I can go through and say, aha, is that something I need to keep or I can get rid of? Uh, I discovered it one time I had 17 copies of one particular photo. Now, how I ended up with those videos, I don't know. But I was able to recover quite a bit of space because I'll say, oh, geez, you know, before I started this backup strategy, I'd make duplicates of individual files to make sure I didn't lose something. It also tells me if some files are missing off the backups because Jim and I will go into all my, all my uh, discs and show me where all the duplicates of a particular file are. That's about the, the only way I know of, of really tracing down duplicates. But I found out that it was a lot worse of a problem than I realized once I ran Gemini of how many duplicates I have. But Mike's solution is the best solution. Don't let it happen to begin with. Um, Barry, or Carolyn's next, I think. I don't really have problems with it either. The only duplicate files I have are the ones that I purposely backed up. But other than that, I don't really have a problem with duplicate files. I don't know, maybe it's a, a Mac thing or something, but I've never seen any. And again, just like Mike said, if it's if you if it looks like it might be a duplicate, it's gonna put a number so you know you already have it. So you would either copy it over because it's a newer version, or you just say, Oh, I have that one, don't worry about it. No, it's not a Mac thing. I have the same problem with Windows. Hmm. I don't know. I've never seen any duplicates myself. How about, yeah. how about you, Barry? <laughs> Am I unmuted? Yeah. I'm on Team McLean with this one. Uh, I don't uh, <laughs> have much problem with it either. I try try to kind of monitor that as I'm working. I can understand how John, you know, his his workflow, especially with photos, as he describes, He's making a, a duplicate of the file on purpose so that he has the original intact and then he works on it. And that's, that's great. Uh, a great practice. Uh, I, you know, I don't, I don't usually do that kind of thing. Um, 
so but it doesn't mean i don't have duplicates i just don't i don't think about it very much either <laughs> but i do follow john's uh practice his recommendation for the gemini 2 application it's it's uh it's by the developer Mac Paw, um, and I use that for general file duplicate um, searching and destroying. Although I haven't done it in quite some time, so you're you're inspiring me to to run it uh, again, John, just to see if I how bad my duplicate problem might be. <laughs> <laughs> that I don't know, I'm not aware of. <laughs> one, of the, one of the problems so. I run into is that I'll take a photo that would be in raw format and then it becomes yeah. a PSD file, then it becomes a JPEG file. And I may export as a JPEG file two or three times for different reasons. So right. I'll end up with the same file name in different file formats. Yeah. But I only need one. The other thing I run into is downloading stuff off the internet. I have downloaded the same document three or four times because I forgot that I downloaded it. Yeah. that That's the biggest thing I find. Um, yeah, like that's IRS happened to me, yes. You know, I discovered that I had, you know, five copies of the 1040A. <laughs> I just forgot that I'd done it. Right. Okay. Now I we're going to have one more. I yeah. do have one more thing to add. Uh, the place that I do know that I probably have duplicates or at least files that are very, very similar is in my photo library. Uh, just from photos I've taken with my iPhone. And a lot of times, you know, I'll take multiple shots that, of a landscape or a family group or something. And eventually, you know, we probably only really need to keep one of the best ones out of those groups. And there's a great piece of software from Fat Cat Software for the Mac called Power Photos. And it has actually also recently been updated for Big Sur and Apple Silicon, which is great. And you can run it uh, and it scans your entire photos library and it will show you duplicates, but not just duplicates. It'll also show you similar. And and you can you can also either create or merge photo libraries if you want to have different photo libraries for different purposes, or if you have multiple libraries and you didn't know about it and you find them, you can use Power Photos to merge them back together. It's a very powerful piece of software for Apple Photos if you're using a Mac. So that's that's what I use for my photos uh, if I need to look through for duplicates. Wow, I'd like that. Um, it's really I mean, nice. Is that in the, the App Store or do you have to do it online? Um, I got it directly from the developer. I don't know if it's in the App Store. I've never looked for it in the App Store. Okay. Fatcatsoftware.com. Okay. Um, our next topic... And our last topic, which is going to be a fascinating one, is uninstalling unused applications. Now, before we get into this, I need to explain some things. On Mac, Windows, and iOS, when you use an application, there may be many, many files that you'll never see associated with that application. So if you delete an application, you may not be deleting all of the application's files. After a while, you can end up with lots and lots of space being used with these files. So with that in mind, yeah, Barry, I think this one's yours. Oh. I was talking and I was muted. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I was saying it doesn't matter what order as long as we all four get a turn, right? <laughs> yep. Okay, so uninstalling unused apps. Um, I've used um, a couple of third party utilities for this over the years. Um, 
And like John said, you know, uh, just dragging a Mac app from your applications folder to the trash and emptying the trash pr probably doesn't and most likely doesn't remove all of the extraneous support files, user settings, preference files that are created when that app is installed and you use it. So even though a lot of those files are just, you know, small text files, if you do that a lot, uh, that, you know, they're just sitting there using up space that you could have available for your own files and it could add up uh, over time. So the first app that I used for this um, was back in the uh, early 2010s. I think my license, the last license uh, update I have record for it is uh, 2012. It's a little, it's a one, one trick pony app uh, called App Zapper. And you can find it at appzapper.com. It's a Mac only. Uh, it's only $20 license. I paid for it in 2011 or 2012. And I actually contacted the developer yesterday and got an email back from him this morning uh, because I was wondering if my license was actually still good or how to how I can get a new license. And he said, your 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 eight year old license or nine year old license uh, now is still should work. Uh, he didn't have anything new to sell. <laughs> so the latest version of the app, I can still install it and use it. Now he also says it should run fine under Big Sur. I haven't tested it yet, but you take an app from your applications folder that you want to delete and you drag it into the app zapper window and it will search your hard drive. It uses the spotlight index that your Mac creates to find all of the associated files that go along with that app. And then you click a button called zap <laughs> and it creates it makes a laser sound and your screen flashes and it deletes the app and all the other stuff. <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> so if all you need to do is remove a few, and I think the trial version will give you five zaps without paying. So if you just have to remove a few apps, you could get the free trial version and do five apps and all their extraneous files with sound effects and, and lighting effects on your screen and have a bunch of fun getting rid of your uh, a few apps. If you need to do more than that, then you have to pay the license fee. But um, if it's just, if that's just one thing you need to do, then uh, that's a, a nice app and apparently it still works with the latest operating system. Uh, the other utility that I've started using since, and that's one reason why I didn't uh, keep app zapper going uh, on a on a newer installation um, was we've mentioned this in a previous uh, me uh, meeting before too is clean my Mac X and uh, it's a forty dollar per year subscription now if you just buy this one app from it's also from Mac Paw the same company that makes um, uh, Gemini 2 that we've mentioned. Uh, it it has a function of uninstalling apps. It has one one of its many functions is uninstalling apps. And it also searches, I believe it does its own independent scan of your hard drive. It doesn't rely just on the spotlight index. And uh, it will find apps, all your apps, whether they're in your applications folder or not, it could be any app anywhere on your device or on your Mac. And uh, by the way, there is a Windows version of this software, Clean My, Clean My PC. Um, and uh, you can see, it'll give you a list of all your apps and you can uh, click on an app and it'll show you all the files that are associated with it and where they're stored on your Mac. And you can tell it to delete each one that you don't want to get rid of as well as 
all the extraneous files. Now, the reason I moved to that mainly for uninstalling apps was because it also offers a lot more than just app un uninstallation. Um, it uh, is a multi-purpose utility for cleaning up unneeded files, system junk. It has malware protection scanning as, and privacy protection tools. It runs uh, optimizations uh, and maintenance tools for speeding up your system. This is the tool I used that I mentioned earlier to run the regular um, Mac OS scripts that would run daily, weekly, and monthly on a restart. But that's why I don't restart usually, except for with this M1 Mac I do uh, more regularly. Um, it has an, an app updating feature. So you can, uh, in addition to uninstalling apps, it'll tell you which apps that you have installed that need to be updated, that there's new versions out there for you to download and install. And it'll do that for you. You can tell it, update this app and it'll go get It'll go get an update for you. You don't have to and install it in most cases. Uh, it'll also manage your uh, extensions, your browser extensions, and it has a whole bunch of storage management tools. Uh, we talked about storage management earlier. Uh, it has built in tools to visualize the size of your files and folders, locate, remove, locate and remove large files and old files. And if you want to, uh, delete files and you want to completely scrub that part of the of the uh, internal storage so that there's no remnant like when we talked about earlier you delete a file and it just says to the system you can use this space again but the file's still really there you can securely erase unwanted files and folders and it actually zeros out or whatever it does to uh, obliterate the data. So it's really not there anymore. It's just a blank part of your internal storage. So that's the main tool I use for all kinds of maintenance, but for uninstalling apps as well. But I am gonna test App Zapper on Big Sur on Apple Silicon and see how it goes because uh, it, it was such a fun tool if all I need to do is just zap a few apps. <laughs> it's it's actually uh, very easy and quick. Uh, if I'm using Windows, which I don't do much, I don't uninstall anything usually <laughs> because my IT department handles that, or they're supposed to. <laughs> so I don't worry about that. And on iOS, um, you don't have to worry about all these extraneous files that much. Um, if you want to delete an app, uh, I just use Apple's standard controls on iOS. Um, you go to jiggly mode, technical term used by Craig Frederici, jiggly mode. <laughs> uh, I don't know, hopefully everybody knows what I'm talking about. Uh, tap and hold on your screen, and then when you're apps start moving around, there's a little X in a circle on the top left corner of the icon. And if you tap that X, you get a, a prompt that says, do you want to delete this app and all its data? Or do you just want to remove it from your home screen? So if you really want to delete it and you're never going to use it, you don't want the data anymore, that's what you choose. If you want to just make space, save space, you can remove it from your home screen, but the data remains intact. So if you ever need to uh, use that app and its data again, you can re-download it and uh, open it up and your data will be intact. But iOS has, I think, been designed from the ground up so that when the, the, app, the app bundles themselves, they don't spread a lot of stuff all over your system. Okay. Um, <laughs> Carolyn, you're up next. 
Yeah, when I uninstall a program, I basically go to my search bar on my laptop, say uninstall. It brings me to the uninstall programs in Windows, and I find the program I want to uninstall, click it, and it uninstalls everything. That's basically how I uninstall programs. Yeah, I, I just want to drop something in. That's one of the big differences between the Mac OS and Windows, is Windows comes with an uninstall program. Mac does not. However, there is something we're going to discover when it gets to me that may change that. Okay. Is that it, Carolyn? That's all I have. <laughs> okay, Mike. Alrighty, as Carolyn said, uh, Windows has gotten pretty good about that. Uh, the uninstall for Windows is in the control panel under uh, programs and features. And when you bring up the list of programs and click on any program, one of the options will be uh, change or uninstall. And it seems to do a pretty good job. I used to uh, use a free utility called CCleaner uh, for looking at for leftover bits. I stopped using them about a year or two back when it came out that uh, they were kind of surreptitiously uh, selling the data that they were scanning off of people's computers. And they kind of did the caveat of, gosh, we're sorry that you caught us. Uh, so I stopped using them at that point. Uh, I do have Norton's Utilities. Uh, that I can use for cleaning up things like the registry and looking for parts. Uh, much like Barry said, I've been using Norton's Utilities in various versions uh, since the mid-90s, probably. And I actually have it installed now. I think I last purchased it about five or six years ago. And I was rather surprised. I was looking at my uh, Symantec account since Symantec bought Norton's uh, some years ago. And it says I still have an active subscription for Norton's Utilities, even though uh, it's one of the things that was actually bought all right. I don't actually pay anything for it per year. They say, yes, you still have an active product. So cool. Uh, one thing I will say is I'm a little reluctant to use that kind of cleaner over much because it really makes me nervous when utilities are scrubbing the registry. The registry is the database of programs that are installed on the system and their uh, configuration attributes. And sometimes a program will get a little overzealous and start taking things out that should probably be better left there. So I'll use these things every now and again, but you really don't want to use it too much, especially you don't want to use it uh, like two or three times in a row. Uh, the chances of something happening kind of go up each time you do that. Uh, but otherwise, that's really uh, about I look at when when I'm uninstalling programs. <clears throat> I don't. I do have something to add, but for the most part, what Barry said would be exactly what I would say. I start out with App Zapper, move to Clean My Mac, the Clean My Mac X. Does a really good job. However, I am going to show you guys something that I don't even think Barry knows about because if he did, he'd mention it. So I'm going to share my screen. Whole desktop. Down in your icons, you'll see one that says that says Launchpad, which I'm sure that almost nobody uses. If you click on Launchpad, it brings up all of your applications that are on your Mac. And this is a fast way of um, getting stuff starting stuff off. You see right here, I'm going to click and hold on it. It starts to jiggle mode. See that little X right up there? That's how you delete the application. And then it asks you, it does an actual uninstall through the um, through Launchpad. But yeah, Mac OS does have a built-in installer that a lot of apps will use. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, to uh, put their package, you know, unpack their packages. And some apps will also have an uninstall function that's part of that same, I mean, the installer app will do the uninstall too. The app has to support it. Uh, but like you're saying with, with Launchpad, I think that uh, the operating system will just use it to uninstall the app and, as, and its component parts. And I had forgotten about that. You're yeah. right. I don't use yeah. Launchpad, like you said. <laughs> yeah. 
In fact, I'm seeing that there's a bunch of applications I didn't realize I still had on here that I can get rid of. With that being said, we've covered everybody on all of our topics for today, which brings us to before we end this month's meeting a few minutes early, are there any more questions, comments, observations? Yes, sir. I would like to know how to answer a chat that Barry sent me. <laughs> In Zoom. Well, you know, do you know where the chat, you have your chat window open? Not Richard? at the moment, but I answered you, but I didn't know how to send it. <laughs> Oh, well, after you finish typing in the in the in the message window, you hit the return or enter key and it'll just put post it. OK, next next month. Um, We're changing the schedule. Yes. And what are we doing next month? How mobile computing devices affect our lives. Aha. Uh -huh. So that's going to be a very interesting discussion. It's probably going to be very similar to the discussion we had this month around Robin podcast type discussion. Um, let everybody participate. And also Maureen had, uh, you know, uh, volunteered to provide some support to this discussion regarding specifically regarding ergonomics. Is Maureen still here? Is she still up for that? So it's also Carolyn's birthday next month oh, on yeah, the meeting day. Right. Yes. So uh, we're going to have a virtual birthday cake. Yes. Ava, you have a question. I just want, I didn't know what Cruft was, but Mike told me that it's lift, leftover bits and pieces. Okay. Anything else? Okay, folks, we will see you mm -hmm. next month, second Saturday of the month. And we'll talk about mobile computing. Everybody have a great weekend. Bye bye. Bye bye.